Amen. All right, so this is what we call the afterburn. And so we'll go ahead and take your comments and questions about that. Look, I do this, for those that are watching this afterburn, I do this because I want to make sure that, or have a good sense of how much you received out of what I said, and how well you received it, and did you receive it the way I intended it. And so this is a real good feedback for me, as well as an opportunity to get clarity for you. All right, so you want to go first, Steve? All right, just, I have several, but I just want to share the first couple if I can. And in 113, it, I just thought, it seems like we want to justify, we assign justification in order to remove responsibility for our desires, and that's in James 113. And then in 117, I, I was wondering, maybe we should redefine, you should look into redefining the, the every, because it says every good gift and every perfect gift. But don't we need to redefine that? Because what is perfect in Abba's eyes may not be perceived as such with our desires. Exactly. Look, and that's why he's trying to differentiate those things that come from the flesh and from the below, from our own desires, and that which comes from above. Okay? All right, Janet? I was making a joke that I needed a full hour with you because <laughs> there's so much in here. Oh, my goodness. This is, this is so great. Well, ever... there's still people that don't like this new. They think this is like my new way of teaching. I've been teaching this way for 20 years. I don't know why anybody thinks this is new. Okay? Sometimes we cover a lot more verses. Today we did. We covered, you know, 20 or 30 verses. And sometimes we cover less verses. It's all about whatever the Ruach wants me to say to make sure you understand the verses. And how it applies in your life. It happens to be in this particular topic, there's not as much mechanics to it. Okay? Go ahead, Janet. Rabbi, um, I do believe 100% that Abba is speaking very loudly, especially to me, since Pesach from Elder Billy and then you, and there's, all, there's a theme here, and I, I'm going to set up a counseling session later to go deeper. But I have a quick question. Um, when you were talking about the process, like your thoughts, get, you know, that you get an emotion attached, and then there's an action, and the destiny. And then putting it together with when you were, you were saying that we have the wrong desires, and we need to clean our hearts to, for him to be able to transform us into his image, that we need to do an internal work. So when you, when you talk about desires and heart, is the heart combining the thought and the emotion? I mean, how, what will be desire? If that, well, the thought yeah, or the emotion? Yeah, desire, okay. desire is going to be a combination of the thought and the emotion because you can't desire something that you're not thinking about. Okay, so you have to have a thought. And that thought, you may not want it. Maybe a thought pops in, lots of thoughts pop in your head that you just outward just reject because it's not something that interests you, but the thought popped in your head. It's the thought that you connect emotionally a desire to, and I shouldn't say desire, an emotion to, like, I want, or I don't, so it becomes a strong thing. Now it's a desire, all right? So that's where that desire, if it's held on to long enough, eventually manifests into an action. And then the piece that you skipped, which is that those actions done over and over again become a habit, and the habitual action leads to a destiny, Okay. And then I have a, another, if you will allow me, it's uh, verse 5, um, when it says, it's actually verse 8, when it says, you too be patient, establish your hearts. Can you elaborate more on the est establish your heart? I know you did cover it, but if you can give me yeah, a no, more. Yeah, no, the establish your heart thing, go back to the heart of the matter. I know it's 64 parts, but a lot of the verses in the heart of the matter talk about Incline your heart, lay up in your heart, establish your heart. In other words, have it so that your heart is directed correctly. Okay, it's focused correctly. So you're establishing a way of feeling and thinking and having your desires, you know, that you will allow to stay there. I mean, thoughts can be any, I mean, you get lots of crazy thoughts in your head every day. We all do. Just thoughts are like, oh my gosh. And then we just don't hold on to them. We just go, well, I'm not acting on that one. And other thoughts... We, we meditate on, we hold on to them. And if we hold on to them, an emotion will eventually attach itself to that thought. And it's when that emotion is connected to the thought that we start to lead in the problem direction. But when you establish your heart, you'll then reject those thoughts much more quickly that don't need to be held on to because your heart's right. 
You won't desire, you won't want those things. Okay? All right. Trish? Shabbat shalom. Shabbat Rabbi. shalom. <laughs> um, you were speaking earlier about when you are asking for healing, if somebody among you is sick, then go to the elders and get prayed for and get anointed. And it, it, you have to have a vertical relationship. Um, can you expound a little bit for me on John 5, where Yeshua healed the the lame man, because my understanding is that that beyond that sheep gate, that was a pagan pool that nobody went to that pool because it was not like a, a holy pool. It was a pagan pool. Okay, so there's, there's two parts to this. One is Yeshua often, almost exclusively really, healed for the witness he gave. Okay, so some of the people went up to him, like the woman with the issue of blood, she just reached out to touch him because she believed. While the captain that came and said, I know you have authority, you can heal my son. But a lot of the healings he did, he did because they were there as a witness to those watching and following him. Especially the one that literally he said that about, the guy who, who was, you know, uh, for, for his whole life was, was suffering this... this, this um, this birth defect, or whatever it was, and they said, well, who sinned? His mother, his father, him, or whatever, and he said, nobody sinned. It was all so that this moment could happen. So the, the things Yeshua did is puts him in a little bit different category because he was doing two things at the same time. Sometimes he was doing it for a building of faith so they would know his authority. Sometimes he was doing it because the people really believed and came to him seeking healing. All right, so they were doing the vertical. Now, one of the verses that we didn't read today, but it's a verse that talks about that you go and you allow, and to the elders for the laying on of hands. Okay, laying on of hands is like the potter and the, and the, and the clay. So it's not laying on of hands as like some ritual religious ceremony. Go to the elders and they'll lay hands on you, like put their hand on your head and pray or something. It means go and submit yourself to let them lay hands on you and mold you and guide you and help straighten you out. Now, that isn't what it says in James there, but it says it in another place. But you can kind of connect them together. So when you need healing, one says go to the elders for the anointing. And, and what it says in James, another place, it talks about the laying on of hands. The laying on of hands is to allow the vertical to get, get a hold of you. And some of you have had tremendous healings when you came and finally allowed the leadership to lay hands on you. Okay? And that doesn't mean physically touching you. It means that you submitted and allowed us to, allowed us to say to you, this needs to mold a certain way and get that fixed, okay? Like the potter and the clay. Does that help? Does that make a difference? Okay. All right. Uh, Chris. Okay, so in um, James chapter 1, uh, you went over uh, verses 23 and 24 and 25. And I was thinking um, with the, the man who looks at himself in the mirror and then looks at... Um, the Torah, I connected that to how um, the Torah is Yeshua. So we're supposed to be looking like him instead of looking at ourselves. Because if we look at ourselves, we'll be like, okay, well, that's, I'm, I'm pretty good. But if we look at Yeshua, then it uh, makes it very obvious what we don't, uh, how we don't look like him. Right. Absolutely. But also, I agree 100%. But also, let's also remember that when you look in the mirror as people always tell you to do, like when you're talking about personal development things, is to recognize that that's the only person that could actually fix you, is you. Now, I'm not saying that he has nothing to do with it. I'm not saying Yahweh has nothing to do with it or, the, or Mashiach has nothing to do with it. What I'm saying is until you are ready to own and fix you, you're not gonna get fixed. You're not gonna get straightened out. So when you look in the mirror and you're looking at the word and the Torah and you're starting to see where the solutions are, you've got to own all that. Okay? It's not like you look in the mirror and expect that smudge on your face to automatically disappear because you look at it. You now got to say, oh, look, it's there. I need to wash it off. Oh, I don't know how to wash it off. Well, let's read the Torah. It tells you how to fix that particular blemish and thing that's wrong. So looking in the mirror is looking at the one person that could actually make all the difference in your life. I know Messiah will make all the difference in your life. And say, but only if you choose the implanted word, and to receive, and to establish your heart, right? All those things, you have to do it. All right, Chris? Um, and I just had a question. Um, we're with uh, James chapter 5, verse 9. Um, so it says, do not grumble against each other, lest you be judged. 
So it's kind of that is really similar to how it, you know Yeshua says, "Don't judge, lest you be judged." So because you uh, have the idea that grumbling against each other is um, kind of like judging, and like it, as a parallel to lest you judge, lest you be judged, lest you grumble, lest you be judged. Yes, they're, they're, they're definitely in the same category. Okay, you're grumbling against your brother. This is going to bring judgment. Okay. Judging others is going to bring judgment. But when you're grumbling, you're almost always, how do I want to put this? You're overstepping what's his instead of what's yours. What his meaning the creator. In other words, you have an issue with somebody that really is between them and the creator, or it's a problem even between you and that person, but really the creator needs to work with them and fix that and get their attention. But you're grumbling against them. And grumbling against them often turns into Lashon Hara, which means you're speaking bad about them to other people, and you're creating other problems. And so you're going to be judged for how you handle things. Don't forget, vengeance is mine, he says, not yours, and those kind of things. That's where the grumbling gets you in all kinds of trouble. Okay, Steve? Okay, so I add a question. Is application of what we hear true wisdom, or is there more to it? Is application of what we hear true wisdom? Um, not, well, wisdom is to apply what you hear, but he gives you wisdom, how to apply, when to apply, what to apply. That's where wisdom, discernment, and understanding kind of come together. So true walking is when you take the wisdom and apply it. So I wouldn't say applying it. It's wise when you apply what you hear. So it's a, it's a, it's a form of wisdom. So I wouldn't necessarily just calling it true wisdom because you can receive absolute pure wisdom and do nothing with it. Okay? All right. And then um, in 5.7, it, it says, be patient until. But uh, I think a lot of us look for what we can do while being patient when we should just be waiting. Yeah, there's a lot of this idea of being patient, waiting. Um, you know, I talk about this in the fear of Yahweh teaching where Moses is told with the children of Israel by the sea before he parts the sea, be still and see the deliverance. Which meant patiently quiet. See, in the movies, you don't see this. Why? Because in the movies, they don't have time for you to sit there and watch that the wind blew all night long and then the sea parted. It just parts like instantaneously. You know, Moses stands in front of it and woof, the whole thing parts. There's no patience there. There's no being still. All right? And so there's a whole different level that's missed by the way it's, put, it's, the way it's portrayed. All right, Ashley? Shabbat Shalom, Rabbi. Shabbat Shalom. Um, I uh, wanted to first and foremost say that... Um, I'm thankful that you chose to do the um, personality, um, what's it called, motivational speaker kind of thing, because we want to be personally like Yahweh and what's better than personal development in okay. the Yahweh. Let me clarify something, though. I didn't choose to do that. It's a natural progression from the mechanics to the development. Okay? It's not like I just decided I feel like being a more of a personal development motivational guy. No. I'm reading you the stuff now that you need to develop, all right? I don't have any mechanics pressing that you need to learn that I haven't taught you. you know, does that make sense now? So it's not like I just decided one day, you know what? I feel like I'm gonna just shift my gears into this motivational thing. People are reading that into it. What I did say when I first started doing that shift a little bit, as I said, I'm really enjoying now that I get to do these things that help you on the inside more because I've already laid the foundation of the outside mechanics. And so please, let's not read the wrong thing into this. I didn't make a shift. It's the other half of the equation that I'm now focusing on. And that half of the equation requires a different approach. Okay? I no longer have to tell you the Sabbath is from sundown to sundown. You don't do any work. Then you, you go to, there's a, it's a holy convocation. And then you go and meet with the, I, I don't have to teach you those mechanics. Now I have to teach you what's going on in here when you keep Shabbat. And how you still mess it up because you don't have the things going on in here right. When you keep the feast, when you eat, you know, the kosher, right? The kosher laws with the foods. And when you uh, tithe and when you, all the different things. That's all the mechanical things. 
you got to work this out now. Even the doctrinal things. So we did mechanics and doctrine, understanding salvation and grace and everything. Those still weren't personal development. Those are still like the mechanics of it, really. But now I'm trying to get you to work on the hard part. You. All right, next. And with that, I just wanted to say um, thank you that you're still here sticking it out with us. Because I'm sure that ain't easy. Because I had my own taste of it this past week. Um, my question is, um, with the grumbling, um, I've been doing a lot of that myself lately, and I've been trying to get out of my own way with that. What are some... What's the words I'm looking for? Get in my head <laughs> and spit it out for me. Um, <clears throat> how do I... How do I get out of my own way with that? And how do, like, if I see something that should be corrected, but it's not my thing to correct, or if I see, um, like, I'm not doing something correct, how do I get out of the way with something like that? All right, I'm gonna, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna develop this, um, anybody know with pets how they have this invisible fence and they have a collar? I'm gonna get you all a collar that when you step outside your bounds, it shocks you. When you go to insert yourself in something that's not yours, it's gonna, you know. Look, you have to ask the better questions. What you have to say is, is this mine to be involved in? I don't like what I'm seeing, I see something's wrong, but you may need to let them learn either themselves or from the right person that needs to be involved and not from you. You have to stop inserting yourself where you don't belong because all that ever happens out of that is everybody suffers, okay? The person you're inserting yourself in with won't like it, and then they'll get mad at you and you won't like it, and then everybody's upset. The whole thing is completely evil, if you understand what I'm saying. Suffering upon suffering. Okay, so when you're watching something, you should always ask the question, should this involve me? Remember I told you that as an observer, you go, oh, that's interesting. That's something over there that's not right. Then you say, I wonder if I should be involved in that or not. Not like automatically you run off. I wonder, is this for me? Don't just insert yourself. Am I the right person to handle this? Now, can I handle it? Am I the right person? To handle? You might think you can, but if you're the wrong person, it doesn't matter. Because you're undermining some other element that's supposed to happen if you insert yourself and you're not supposed to. Now, there are times when you're supposed to, but you should know the difference. And that takes practice and time and discernment that we get with wisdom over time, all right? Wisdom is, you know, what we learn from experience often enough. All right, go ahead. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to say, um, thank you for the realization of the baseball, baseball glove mentality of receiving. Um, I actually flipped it around. Um, drop the ball, let it go. Okay. I struggle with let go. I'm still trying and still struggling. All right. Well, let's put it this way. The baseball glove, let me just take your analogy. You can sit down, but I'll just explain your analogy. She said drop the ball. Okay, so let's use the analogy of you're supposed to put away all filthiness, etc., and evil. You can't catch a ball if the glove already has a ball. All right? So you have to take the other one out. Get rid of it so you can catch... So you've already got this ball that you've been playing with that's the evil and the filth, filthiness and all this other stuff that, you, that you're trying to get. You gotta get rid of that one so you can receive the other stuff from above. Hallelujah. All right? So you do have to drop that one out. Okay? Because otherwise you try to catch the new one and it will bounce out because there's no room. Okay? Good, good, good uh, point there. Okay. Marlene. Hey, Rabbi. Hey. Um, so, ha, this was a really good teaching, and um, yeah, <laughs> it just, the father was just talking to me the whole time, and uh, so um, when you were talking about desiring the wrong things is the cause of my suffering, and so I started think about, thinking about, you know, my desires and things I've been doing, you know. Um, to try to get my desires, and you know, uh, I think a lot of times we can have like maybe somewhat wholesome desires, or we have a reason why we want whatever it is we want, 
but um, you know, when you're reading about the desires eventually manifest into sin, like it makes you do something. And so focusing on getting, what I, what I got from this is focusing on getting the stuff we want. Like even if the thing is like a good thing to have, um, if we focus on that, it's like it allows the below to come to, to us more, like focusing on the, the desire of the stuff we want. So I was, I was it, a, a scripture came to mind, I looked it up, uh, Matthew 6, 33. Now, it's interesting because when I first memorized the scripture, this is, this is what I wrote. Okay, this is from the King James, back, you know, when I first started walking with right. Yeshua, you know. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Yep. And then I read it in this version, <laughs> and it says, But seek first the reign of Elohim and his righteousness, and all these shall be added to you. So what I found this time is that the reign of Elohim is the vertical alignment being correct. Yep. And if you are my covering in leadership, you know, you are my covering. Me being an independent single woman, need to use you all as my covering as if you were my husband and go to you with these desires and talk to you about getting in the correct vertical structure with these desires. So I just want to say I'm repenting right now <laughs> of what I've been desiring and trying to pull to myself, looking for little, you know, like, oh, this is a sign that this is coming to me, and oh, this is what I should be doing, and not talking to my vertical structure, because this is what submission is. And so I think we have these ideas, you know, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. Anyway, so I'm going to get in alignment, and I'm with you all all the time, so I need to just talk to you all about what I want and get into the right vertical alignment. Awesome. Appreciate that. Look, there's, there's um, a movie and a book called The Secret. A lot of people know about that. And it talks about this thing called the law of attraction. And I explained it to you from here, which is when you focus on something, those things tend to manifest in your life, but it's not because they magically appear, okay? In other words, a lot of motivational you know, success coaches will talk about you know, having a dream board, you know, like a board you put up on your wall with pictures of things you want, the house you want, the car you want, and, everything. and you know what? If you focus on them, eventually you end up with them. You know why? Because you will then start to do the things that get you those things. Guess what? It works in the negative too. You start thinking negatively about your spouse, positively about wanting somebody else, and next thing you know, you're in an affair. Not because, not because it magically appeared, but because you start to do the things that will manifest what it is you've been focusing on. All right? So they make it sound like it's some magical thing, but it's not. But it is a law and it does work. You will manifest what you focus on over time. Because over time, you will start to, on a conscious and subconscious level, start doing the things that will lead to you having that result, that fruit. And so just, that's what the scripture is talking about here too. If you seek first the kingdom and his righteousness, then these things that he tells you come, he tells you these are the fruit of that relationship then seeking it, you'll start doing the actions that bring it about in your life. And so that's the whole thing with the desire. So if you desire something that you shouldn't have, the more you focus on it, the more likely it's going to manifest in your life. And again, not supernaturally. You will consciously or unconsciously start doing things that lead to bringing that about. Does that, you understand that now? Okay. So while the occult New Agers all think that the secret's some big deal, it's actually very scriptural. 
Okay, it's very scripturally based. You tend to manifest what you focus on, good or bad. Because the action, right, the thought, you start thinking about the car you want, you're desiring the car you want, you focus on it all the time, guess what? You realize I don't have enough money to get that and next thing you know you're getting a better job, you're taking more hours, because you want the thing. It doesn't just show up in front of your house with the keys, all right? And so whatever it is, good or bad, we should say appropriate or inappropriate, scripturally, like Torah correct or, or, or against Torah, you're going to manifest it if you focus on it. But not like you focused on it for five minutes. You have to really focus on it. And that's where that patience comes in. And so if you're focusing on the wrong things, though, you're still going to manifest those things as well. Because you're going to start doing the things that bring about the result. All right, Janet, you get to throw one last one in there, and then we go to the live stream. Very quickly, thank you, Rabbi. The confession of sins of 516, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another. Could that be your husband or a leadership? It, it could be anybody that you have the appropriate relationship with that you can trust them. In other words, you need to get it out where you admit you have a problem and have somebody help you deal with your problem. That's all confess your sins mean. Okay? All right? It simply means have somebody that's a confidant that you can share with and say, you know what, I'm really struggling with this, whatever this is. You know, one of the, the hardest things that's out there for the men is that so many of them struggle with porn, with pornography, but they don't feel like there's anybody that they can share that with because they're embarrassed, they're ashamed. And so if you can't share, then how can you ever deal with something? So you need somebody who it's safe to share with whatever it is you're struggling with, who's not gonna attack you, judge you, and, and you know, make you pay a heavy price just because you shared information, who's gonna be there with you in your struggle to encourage you on your getting out of your struggle and dealing with your struggle, all right? Ladies do this much more naturally. They go to each other and share everything. Men, not so much. Okay, men don't share things. Not with women, not with each other. Not, they just keep a lot of stuff in, especially the stuff that they think because of their, you know, men are very, very protective of their pride, okay, and that ego, and they're proud. And so they don't want anybody to know that they have a weakness. And so they won't counsel about the stuff they struggle with. But a real man will because a real man wants to get clean and right and get that stuff fixed. And so they have to be willing to counsel. All right, let's go to the live stream, Rob. Justin Snyder says, Rabbi, would you say that in Yaakov chapter 1, verses 13 through 17, could be cognitive behavioral therapy? A thought slash desire leads to emotions slash feelings, which leads to actions, and those lead to consequences, good or bad. Sure, that works. Okay, from Chris Adelina Newman, if I, okay, so if I strategically play or send these teachings to my husband, am I interfering with Yahweh's plans? <laughs> uh, look, how do I want to put this? Look, let's not send anything to anybody they don't want it, okay, unless they want it. If you happen to be playing it in the background because you tend to play teachings and you think they might hear it, that's, I guess that's fine. If they don't want to hear it, they'll leave the room or ask you to turn it off. But if, I wouldn't send anything to anybody without asking them if they'd like to hear it. Okay, because then you're already setting them up for a defense mechanism to reject it just because you're forcing it on them un unsolicited. Okay? So playing teachings in the background, if that's something you already do, and you want to play this particular one or a particular one because you think it may be something they need to hear, I suppose there's nothing wrong with that. And maybe Abba will inspire them to move over and listen a little closer. But now you're just doing something that you do, and they can or can't, they could choose not to listen or not. But sending it to them, I think, is a little bit crossing the boundary, okay? I don't have a problem with you asking your husband if he'd like to hear something. Hey, I've got something I think that would be great for you to hear. Would you like me to send it to you? That would be something I, I would be fine with. But I wouldn't just send to people without asking, okay? All right, next. Okay, from Nicole Davison, or from Rocky. It says, how do you become more like Yeshua if you don't work on personal development? You don't. <laughs> okay, you can't. And so I appreciate, he put that there basically, you know, to agree with what I was saying, saying, like, it can't be done. You can't become like Yeshua if you don't work on yourself. 
Okay, you have to work on the parts of you that don't match with him and get them in line with him. That, that's where mo- the effort is in that part. It's not an effort to keep the Torah mechanics. I mean, is it arduous and hard to eat differently? Is it arduous and hard to keep different days? I mean, the hard part is working on you. That's the frustrating, relentless, hard part. Okay, next. Okay, I have a couple here about the putting away. It says, can we say that putting away is not allowed to, is not allowing to have any association with, with you anymore? And Shelly Bell is, asked, is putting away the right term for cutting off the relationship with those that are and can be a bad influence. And then she's follow up was, is it evil that I've actually stopped all communication with people that have left MTOI? Okay. So let me, the first two ones, I, I would say yes. It, the idea of putting away is to cut off relationship with, okay? And so, and it's a serious thing, which is why Yeshua talks about in a marriage, he doesn't say the word divorce in Matthew, by the way. He says putting away. That, that there's, you know, putting away is a serious thing. And it has to be for serious reasons to put away. Divorce can be for almost any reason. I don't want to mess you guys up. I don't think you should divorce for any reason. I'm just saying is there's no scriptural, like it has to be this, this, or this for a divorce. But putting away is because of sexually immoral behavior on, on some level, all right? And, it's a, and in the case of putting away from a marriage, it's a very public thing, which then would prevent the woman from being able to get married ever again. All right, it really marks you in a strong way. When we're talking about putting away all filthiness and all this evil and stuff out of your lives, we're talking about having no longer having a relationship with it, cutting it off. So that's correct. All right, now, as far as, you know, if you cut off relationships with people that have left, uh, you know, a particular group that you're a part of, whether it's MTOI or some other thing, okay, um, it's, it's going to be evil, based on who's perceiving it. In other words, if it causes anybody to suffer, evil is the right label, okay? So is it evil that I've actually stopped all communication with people that left MTOI? Okay, they may think so. You may suffer because you cut off those relations, so you may think so. Okay, remember, all that's necessary for something to be evil is suffering, harm, or destruction. Okay, pain. If it hurts, evil is a label you can use for it, okay? Comment, I'm a part, I'm part of MTY family, and if they choose to return MTY, I'll welcome them with open arms. Okay, that's great. Look, if people come or go, your choice and how you handle that, just realize if they left and they have reasons, they always have reasons, they may or may not share them with you. And, then what, and by the way, the reasons they share may not be the real reasons. It may be the one they think is plausible that you'll accept. They may not share the real reason. Realize you have a chance to be influenced. Lots of you have had that experience where, at least for a short term, you spoke to some of the people that left, whoever they were. They all left for different reasons. Some of them left for you know, different similar reasons, but they all left for their own reasons. But you, are, you could be susceptible. You know, we used to call this in multi-level marketing, we used to call it being SNIOPT, which is an acronym for susceptible to the negative influences of other people. Okay? Okay? S-N-I-O-P, right? Susceptible, negative influences of other people. We are all susceptible to that. So I would limit and be very cautious with my relationships and interaction with people that have left any group you're in because they could negatively influence. Let's say you're at a job and you like the job and somebody hated the job and quit the job and is all negative about the job. You hang out with them, they're going to try to get you to think negatively about your job even though you love the job and the people there treat you great. But they're going to point, that what they're doing is they're trying to poison your thought process about that thing that you're a part of that they're no longer a part of, whatever it is, okay? Some of you have family members doing that, family members that you don't have a relationship with right now because they're mad at you for not going to their wedding or whatever it is, and now they're going to get everybody in the family mad at you, okay? Or what if they're mad at another? How many of you have siblings or family members that are mad at each other and they want to get you now mad at the other one because they're mad at the other one? Let's say you've got several children and one of them's fighting with the other one and they call you trying to get you to take their side. That's the same thing that happens with congregations. So let's, let's, let's try not to do that, okay? Let's try not to do that. All right. Anything else? From um, Warrior Lion, 
So this question, in the context of asking for wisdom, in verse 5, can you elaborate on the difference between knowledge and wisdom? Okay. So there's, there's three things that are talked about in Proverbs, and they actually form the acronym for the Chabad, the Orthodox Jewish group, the Chabad. It's Chochma, Bina, and Da'as, or Da'at, which is they have wisdom, understanding, and you have knowledge. All right? And so, um, Chachma is wisdom, okay? Bina is understanding, and Das is knowledge. Now, they're different, okay? You have understanding that comes into you. You learn something, you have understanding. Then as you do it, you have knowledge because that's relational. Wisdom, though, is what you have first that encourages you to gain the understanding and the knowledge. Because you, you are given information from a source that you trust, and so that's the wisdom. The wisdom from above encourages you to get understanding in something so that you can do it and have a relationship with it. So wisdom is things like, there's a creator. Wisdom is, and so you don't know that. You don't, you, you don't even understand that at first. But you have to gain understanding that there's a creator and then have a relationship with the creator. Wisdom is that there's a Messiah. Do you understand that at all at the beginning? No. What's a Messiah? What does he do? What's the really, then, you underst, then through understanding and knowledge, through, through relationship, right? You think that, that's how it plays around. And then, by the way, doing that gives you more discernment in it so that you have more wisdom to gain more understanding, to gain more knowledge, more relationship. So it's a powerful loop that you can go through. By the way, that loop works in good and evil, or good and bad, because you can have wrong information that's, that's wisdom from the wrong side, right? And then you understand it and start doing it, and you end up deeper in that loop because you think that it's actually wisdom, but it's coming from the wrong source. You learn that in the church system, all kinds of stuff that sounded like wisdom, information from what sounded like learned sources. That's what we'll call wisdom. Information, ideas that come from a accepted, respected source. Right or wrong, it's what it is. And then you have to seek to understand that information. What am I supposed to do with it? What is it actually? And then when you apply it, you have now knowledge. This is why they were told not to eat of the tree of good and evil, right? The, knowledge, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now that was wisdom, that was information. So that's wisdom. Now, did they understand why? No. So this is why Hasatan tried to insert understanding. He said, well, he's just doing that because he knows in that day it's good for you, right? She, she looks at it, it looks pretty, it looks good, good to eat. And he says, in that day you'll be like him and he doesn't want you to be like him. So now Hasatan is sharing wrong understanding of the wisdom. And then they would then have a knowledge of both good and evil, a relationship with both. So that's, that's hopefully kind of gives you the, 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 the three of them, how they work. Okay, you only asked for two of them in the question, but that's the three pieces. Okay, wisdom is information from what's supposed to be a an appropriate sort. The actual, that's what we're talking about, the, seek the wisdom from above, not the wisdom from below. Okay? There's a way that seems right to a man. That's called the wisdom from below. Right? Seems right. I don't maybe understand it, but it seems right. But as I understand it and do it, I may come to realize it wasn't right. Okay? Next. Uh, yeah, he said that, uh, that, or they said that, you know, thanks that, for that outstanding answer. It really helped them. Good. So, um, I think you just answered this one too. J, J. Jones, James 1 5 mentions wisdom from Shlomo. We learned that wisdom is proper discerning between good and evil. Is that your best understanding how James is defining wisdom? Yeah, no, I think I covered that. Yeah, good. Um, and by the way, Shlomo is not telling you that wisdom is a proper discernment. Wisdom, what he gave him was the wisdom from above. He asked for the wisdom from above. So he could see things like Yahweh sees things. So he'd have the good discernment. All right? So he asked for wisdom from Yahweh. That was his trusted source. So wisdom from Yahweh is not just wisdom in general. It's wisdom 
to see things from the above, to be given that insight and discernment. Of course, he lacked understanding and knowledge because he went off in some directions he shouldn't go in. So wisdom without the other things is not enough. All right, go ahead. From Anna Uden says, Rabbi, how do you handle a situation with your spouse when their behavior is affecting you? How do we go about it without trying to make them change or set, quote unquote, set them straight? All right. This doesn't work. Period. <laughs> I counsel a lot of couples. It doesn't work. Look, how do you handle a situation with your spouse when their behavior is affecting you? Look, there's, you can obviously talk to them and try, and that may work. I mean, that's the only thing that could work, is if you talk to each other and have a way to communicate and share when you're not happy about something. And, and if that doesn't work, though, then you need to bring it above. You've got to work your way up the chain of the vertical and come to me, which you guys do, and then we could try to work that out. This is especially important for the spouse being the wife. Okay, the wife, you cannot correct your husband. It doesn't work. You can't do it. If you've tried it, you already know it doesn't work. It only blows up in your face and makes it worse. Okay? Because the below cannot correct the above. Even if the above, by the way, the above, the person above you can, it certainly can be imperfect and horrible and everything else, but they're above you. It just happens to be where they are. They're not there because they're so righteous. It's there because that's the physical structure. That's the vertical structure. The husband is above the wife in the alignment. That doesn't mean that the husband's any better. It doesn't mean that he's more perfect. He could be terrible. But you can't fix him or correct him from below him. Just like your children. How would you feel if your children tried to correct you? Yeah. Okay, and they have tried. You get children long enough, they will try to correct you. And you will shut that down so fast their head will spin. Okay? Try that with your husband. It might be the same result. So all you can do is seek someone above him. Which is why, by the way, if you're in this husband and wife and you're not in um, counsel on any kind of basis, then you're in trouble. I don't mean you're in trouble with me. You're in trouble with each other because you don't have a place to go. But if you're both in agreement that you're under that vertical meaning someone like me or Elder Billy, whoever, if you're vertically under an MTOI covering or whoever you're covering, let's say you're going to another congregation, someone, whatever, if you're not under that covering together, then you have nothing you can do. Because nobody has any leverage on your husband who's not voluntarily submitted to by him. If he's not voluntarily submitted to them, it can't work. Now, of course, if this is the husband saying about the wife, well, as a husband, you should be able to go and correct your wife, but you should do it lovingly, respectfully, knowing that you are dealing with, quote, the weaker vessel, simply meaning that emotionally they can be more fragile. Well, I've seen some men that were more fragile than their wives. Okay? But realize that it depends on if it's the husband or the wife, how it's handled. Okay? But you can't, you know make them change. It's how do we go about without trying to make them change? You can't do it that way. You can only go to them and say, I want to appeal to you. I'm, I'm being affected by something you're doing. It's hurting me, and I, I don't know what to do. Ask them. Men are really good for this. Ask them for help. Don't attack them. Say, these things that you're doing are really hurting me, and I don't know what to do. I want to, I'm asking you to help me with how we can fix this. Okay? Ask them to fix it. Men have it in them somewhere. Some of them have it really big. Some of them have it really hidden in them, this desire to fix things. Okay? Men were put here to fix things. Now, they don't do that always, and some don't do it ever, but that's what they were supposed to do. Okay? Women were put here to nurture things. I'm just making it simple. Okay? Now, if you have a man who's very much a man, a strong man, especially if their color code is red, that's all they're focused on is what needs fixing and I'm going to fix it and I don't care emotionally to be all, necessarily all the general about it. They're just going to fix it. And so when you come to me with anything, I just want to know what do you need fixed? Okay? Which is a challenge if I don't have the other side of it, which is to be more relational and compassionate and everything else. But it's somewhere in your man, your husband, somewhere in him, he wants to be the one fixing things. So ask him for help. Okay, ask for help. All right, next. Okay, um, 
I got that's the last I've got from the online. But I got one, Rabbi, for you from me is um, when you were we were speaking there in chapter one, verses nineteen and twenty about uh, people being um, slow to speak or quick to anger and stuff like that. You know, and you said that that they they I guess they they jump in and start doing things like that. But I know you've talked about you've counseled with people couples and in, you know the lady was asking well I don't know why he doesn't do this and then he's realized that he can't do that I mean so is there a point where if we're like interacting with somebody and they don't know you know that they're actually being you know I guess quick to wrath or or something like that. maybe that's just something that they just didn't realize nobody has, has account, hold, hold them accountable for that and they just didn't know that it was it was it was wrong all right, this, this is probably the 50th or more time I've said this, but I'm going to say it because it needs to be said, and it answers this, this question specifically. But I'm going to package it a little differently this time, okay? because you'll recognize it, those who've heard me when I say it. You have to start off recognizing that every one of you is broken. Okay, you're broken. In other words, when you have something and it doesn't work the way it was designed to work, it's broken, right? You buy something and it's not working right. So what do you say? You say, it's broken. Well, guess what? You're broken. You're not working right. Man, woman, husband, wife, father, daughter, sister, brother, there's parts about you that don't work right. So you're damaged, you're broken, you're dysfunctional, meaning you don't function right in some area. Okay? Because everybody goes, well, I came from a dysfunctional family. And now you are a dysfunctional family. And you're a dysfunctional human being. Because that's what we all are. We don't function right. And so once you accept that reality, when you are doing the next thing I say, I want you to look for and identify what's broken, damaged, and dysfunctional and stop fighting with it and accept that it's a handicap. Okay? Now, because some of you will buy something that doesn't work right, and you'll be willing to accept that it's, it still works, but not exactly the way you want, but you'll accept that it still works. It's good enough. It still gets whatever I need done to whatever degree. All right? So now I want to say what you've heard me say many times. In all relationships, you must observe the other person. You got to learn where they're broken, what their strengths are, where their weaknesses are, and everything, and then you need to adjust to that. All right? You may have a spouse that's intolerant to certain things or responds a certain negative way to certain things, and yet you keep doing them. And then you act surprised when they act that way. Yet this is the way they function in their dysfunction. And then you get all angry and mad because they act that way. Okay? I have, I'm gonna, it says confess to your brothers. I have like zero tolerance for drama. Don't bring drama around me. I don't, I don't do drama. But if you do, and I shut it down or have a problem with it, it shouldn't surprise you if you've been observing and learning so you should make an adjustment. I probably shouldn't bring my drama to him. Okay? There also could be timing issues. You know, maybe you have issues with your spouse and you, you're picking the wrong time to address them. Some of you want to do this thing first thing in the morning. Maybe you want to do it first, you know, right before you go to sleep. And some people really hate that. Why'd you wait till we're about to go to bed to do this? Why'd you wait? I just woke up. Can you give me five minutes? I mean, you know, so learn. Because that person isn't saying maybe I'm not going to deal with this stuff, but you're, you're not learning when the best time to do it is. Well, but that's not convenient for me because I want to deal with it right now. Well, guess what? It's not going to work. At some point, you got to adjust. Okay? And so does that help, Rob? Does that kind of answer the question? All right? Yes, see, see, almost all the marriages that I counsel, you know why you guys are all screwed up and having such problems? Because you will not do what I just said. You do not pay attention enough, and if you do pay attention, you're not learning anything. 
Because what your husband or your wife is doing that's driving you crazy, they've been doing it for 25 years, you know it, you, and you don't any, there's no adjusting. You keep thinking they're just going to stop. Well, they're not going to stop. And you walk right into that buzzsaw over and over again and trigger the tripwire or whatever you're doing, relentlessly ignoring that it's there. You see, it's one thing to have it camouflaged and hidden and you trip over it. No, this thing is thick as the thickest rope you ever saw right in your face and you hit it anyway. It's got warning written all over it. And you walk right over and you go, woof, and you just knock that wire. The first time you did it, it was buried and hidden. You didn't know. And you were surprised. After 15, 20, 30 years, that thing is right there with neon signs blinking in front of you and you'd ignore it. And then you act surprised. You do. Well, I keep thinking he'll change. I'll keep thinking she'll change. For 30 years now? 20 years now? Haven't gotten the message yet, have you? That people don't change that much necessarily, especially with their broken stuff. Oh, then you get frustrated because they're broken in a way that's different than you. So you don't understand how they could be broken because you're not. Yeah, but they're not broken in your area. I mean, <laughs> you know. And, and you guys could be so happy. Everybody could. You know, life is really not that tough. We make it tough because we're so, I was going to use a word. We're so selfish. I was going to say we're so damn selfish. Okay? We are. We're just so extremely selfish that everything bothers us that's not our way. Everything irritates us if it's not our way, or at least enough stuff does that we're always fighting and fussing and, and miserable with our spouses because it's not everything my way. You could be alone. Matter of fact, you probably should be because you're going to bring that same junk to the next one if you get a next one. I don't think divorce fixes that. Look, I get, I get divorce for abuse, okay? I get divorce for, for those kind of horrible things. But if it's just because you can't tolerate each other's brokennesses and adjust to each other, that's just dumb. Because there's no marriage that doesn't have that. There's no marriage that doesn't have that. So stop thinking if you married somebody else, it would be so much better. Maybe that one little part wouldn't you be fighting about some other dumb thing. Because every marriage has got stuff, so might as well deal with the one you got. At least, she, at least he or she, whichever side you're on, at least already knows your junk. And for the most part has tolerated it. Because otherwise you wouldn't have made it 20 years. And again, I'm not talking about more extremes of abuse and neglect and those, that harshness that's there. Because mostly the, the, most couples who don't have that, they fight over the just intolerable, never-ending little things that won't go away. Okay? Those little things that they can't adjust to. And then there wouldn't be a problem. And I've had to sit couples down and, that they, and get in their face and they want to argue with me. I said, because you're not learning him or you're not learning her. Are you paying attention? I'm, I'm getting it in the few minutes I know you guys. Has it been this way? Yes. How long has it been this way? 15 years. <laughs> and I'm tired of it. How about adjusting to it? How about that? I don't want to adjust to it. He has to adjust to me. She has to adjust to me. How about adjusting to each other? Grow up. <laughs> okay? I don't know what else to say. Grow up. This is like baby stuff. You know, he puts you in a marriage because it gives you a taste of what it's like to be with him. And we do the same thing with him. We, we won't adjust. And he's not adjusting to you. He, in, in, in that marriage, he's right and you are wrong. In your marriage, you're right sometimes and the other one's right sometimes. And you're wrong sometimes and the other one's wrong sometimes. But in the one with him, you're always the one that's wrong. You have to learn to adjust. And you do that by learning him. You don't get to observe him, but you get to observe the results of when you didn't learn him. 
and you didn't adjust to him because then he gives you a little smack or he gives you a wonderful blessing and you learn to adjust. Or I should say you learn and you adjust. Every relationship, that's the... I don't know how this came to my head. I praise Yah that he did, but that's the answer to every relationship, whether it's vertical with ministry, whether it's husband and wife, parent with a child, employee with an employer. All successful relationships are going to be observing, learning, and adjusting, period. Okay? It's not complicated. All right? But you can't do that if your feelings bag is emptied on the floor and everything is being stepped on everywhere because then everything irritates you and everything hurts and everything offends you and everything and that, that can't work in a relationship no relationship could last with that alright anyway and of course if you had somebody early on to go to and counsel with before it got to be 15 years of it you know you would have been in better shape okay all right. That being said, I think that gonna, that's going to cover it. Thank you all for the questions and the comments.